This episode of Back to the Roots podcast is brought to you by Byron Seeds. The folks at Byron Seeds believe organic requires a different perspective, plan, and approach. Organic isn't simply a different type of product or even a different way of farming. It's a different way of thinking, planning, commitment. It's a different philosophy on how to feed the world. Many won't understand, but the people at Byron Seeds do. We're owned by organic dairy farmers. We not only have the product, but we plan, manage, and execute organic. We speak your language, we share your struggles, and we laud your successes. Organic isn't a way of doing business, it's a community. We learn from each other. We're in this together. We'd be glad to talk cropping plans, management systems, the road to profitability. We understand what you're trying to do. We're farmers just like you. Visit us at byronseeds.net or give us a call at 800-801-3596. And thanks to Byron Seeds. You're listening to Back to the Roots Podcast. I'm Mike Klein, and along with Brian Wood, today we are in Sugar Creek, Ohio, on my grandpa's farm where my mom grew up with my aunt, Mary Hostetler. Along with her husband, Bert, uh, they have Sweetwater Farm, which is a farmer's market that is very popular in the area. So Mary, thank you so much for joining us today. And can you just give us a little bit of a bio and a little bit of a background on how you got started? Okay, we took over my dad's dairy farm in 1978. No, I'm wrong. I'm sorry. 1976. Um, My dad was getting older, and so we um, took over the dairy farm and rented from my dad for uh, a number of years and then eventually bought the farm from him and continued as a dairy, a small dairy. Uh, I think we generally milked 20, 25 cows is where we were at. And as our boys grew older, uh, we really had a desire to take a trip west with our family before they were grown and gone. And our farm is rather unique because it is now literally incorporated into the village of Sugar Creek. Uh, We have two and a half acres that isn't, but everything else is. And so uh, we were a little crippled as far as being able to enlarge. Our youngest son really was interested in farming, but um, there's not enough space here uh, to increase the dairy, and we really didn't want to be a huge dairy. And so uh, my sister Elsie was one that said, you should raise produce, raise extra produce. You look at your location, you could do that. And so the first year, our our thing is we wanted to take this trip. So for the first two years, we just raised extra, a little bit extra this and that, and set up a card table by the road with a sign. A sign means nothing unless you have something to show. We learned that quickly. And so the first two years, every penny we made, we put in savings. And the third year, the third season, we took our trip west as a family and had a wonderful time. But uh, our son wanted to be involved in the farm. And so what started as saving money for a trip, we had to become diversified. We had to be diversified with our location And with the inability to grow the dairy, we started raising produce. Excuse me. And so um, that's how it all began. And so it has just gradually grown. We grew in baby steps. We just raised a little extra corn, a little extra this and that. And um, we tried to raise a lot of smaller niche items that your general farm market doesn't carry. But eventually, we got to the point uh, that we couldn't do it all. And so we have, since 19, uh, well, it doesn't matter what year, but it was the year Chris got married, um, 
we made the decision to not try to raise melons, not try to raise raspberries, because you don't do anything right when you try to do it all. So we now um, get our fruit from local farmers, uh, melons, um, the berries. We have several different, just little family farms that have raspberries, strawberries, et cetera. And so we buy all our fruit from other local farms, and we try to raise about 90% of the vegetables that we sell. And then uh, the other thing that really changed, uh, peaches, uh, large quantity, canning amount, that we grew in that. And that was strictly because the demand was there. People would ask, don't you get peaches? Don't you get peaches? And this area, this year it was a phenomenal peach crop. But many a year, they freeze, and so we get them from the south. So that's basically how it got to where we're at today. In 19, I should say this, we had the card table the first year, then we had a little red barn out here by the road, which parking was a huge problem. <laughs> little old ladies would just stop right on the road. And, <laughs> and so then we had a little, yeah, we had the little red barn, and then 98, Bert built the the building we're in now mm -hmm. and up above the barn and dragged it down and here we are <laughs> now was chris running the dairy here then in those early years so the early once once he was married he actually worked for us and okay. ran the dairy which would have been uh he got married in 99 so by then he was he soon learned he was just not cut out to go work on a day job. That just wasn't what he wanted to do in life. And so um, it would have been that year that he, that he got married that he literally uh, basically took over the dairy. And then, of course, uh, you know, he uh, had an opportunity to buy a farm in the Stone Creek area, and he had just bought the cows from us that June, and that was 16 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would have been 16 years ago in the spring that he bought the cows and then moved down. So mm -hmm. that changed our future. Mm -hmm. Did you then decide to just expand the farmer's market and let it go, no, or did it just, that just happen? It just, it just happened. Mm -hmm. And people think we're bigger and bigger. We really aren't. We're not, we're not farming more land. Uh, we've grown people. Mm -hmm. That's the big thing. We have just simply grown uh, we have wonderful customers. We really do. And it's become much more competitive than it was when we started. There's a farm market in every corner. Mm -hmm. But this is a, yeah, farm market versus farmer's market. Uh, but, um, but just with trying to have quality, fresh, and people like to know where their, their food comes from. The generation now is much more concerned about that than my generation mm -hmm. was. Mm -hmm. You're really, and you're like you said, you're literally in town here. We are. So you literally. have a giant client base right here. Well, but we are on a side street. Mm -hmm. um, State Route Thirty Nine is where where it's all at. But I thank the Lord that we're not on State Route Thirty Nine. I mean, it is. We often have if out of towners find us they often come back if they come to the area. You do have people that come to the area a couple times a year. And if they find us, if they like a little place, they'll be back. Mm -hmm. But we see the same people every week, plus add on some others. Mm -hmm. But that's what we enjoy. We get to know our customers. Uh, that has been a huge, huge thing for us because, you know, some people are here several times a week. You know, they just buy what they need and then they're back again. So that's, that's become very, very personal to us. Uh, unfortunately, there's many people I don't know their names, and yet I consider them friends. Oh, I don't know what their name is. They know mine, but we see so many faces. So, How many acres are you on here? The whole farm is 78. Uh, what is in produce um, is only, well, it's changed quite a bit because... This is the second year. I mean, Bert and I are not getting younger, and we have to do something to be able to continue. It's either tweak it a little bit or close the door because we're getting tired. We're 69 and 70, 
And uh, so the last two years, we've had, um, we had two guys that have helped us with sweet corn, for example, um, for large quant- We do a lot of large quantities of all vegetables and fruits for canning and preserving. And so we asked Furman, the guy that raises corn, to help us two years ago. He said, would you be interested in doing it all? He said, yeah, I think I can do that. We had to tweak it a little bit because you need a huge amount of corn the first two weeks in August. And then, you know, less in the beginning and a little bit less at the end. And that has saved Bert mm-hmm. hours and hours. It, it's worked out very, very well. And he grows his corn basically just like we did. So that, you know, just, you know, and, and see if we can get somebody to help with green, more with green beans, you know. Green beans are very easy to raise, but they're very labor intensive. And we're paying more for labor than I ever dreamed we could. Mm-hmm. But you have to, or you don't have help. Mm-hmm. And so you're, you're tapping into a market of people that want to know where their food's coming from. Does organic factor in there? It does and it doesn't. There's some people that really ask a lot of questions. But the biggest question we get is, is it yours? We are not certified. We use organic practices, but we are not certified. Um, and if, if, if we see we're going to lose a crop, we might use something, uh, but very, very seldom. Mm-hmm. Um, so basically, you know, our, our stuff is organic. Uh, yeah organic enough that the bean beetles ruined my second to last patch. I mean, and I, we didn't catch it in time because there is a spray that we use, an organic spray that we spray our kale with uh, weekly. And it probably would have worked, but we didn't see it in time. And they literally destroyed the green beans. Really? Oh, yeah. I always say if it wouldn't be for weeds and bugs, this would be fun. <laughs> a lot of that (laughs) yeah that's a constant struggle it is isn't that a conventional farmer's mindset though you know that's why the chemicals were introduced in the first place make it easy to make it easy Mm -hmm. but then there's repercussions exactly because there's there are a lot you know and and i it really bothers if anything gets to me it's it's august is so intense you know it's, we're in Ohio, and things all come at once. And then it really bothers me if you see fields that just look a mess because you simply didn't get time to keep the weeding, stay on top of the weeding. Mm-hmm. And there is a lot of weeding. Now, something that, um, I don't know, was it you, Mike, or, or, or was it Tim? Um, this, I actually, one day I said to Bert, there has to be a better way. You know, we put down plastic. We lay plastic for most of our vegetables, not green beans, not beet. Well, yeah, beets we did in plastic as well. And uh, But then in between the rows, it was always a mess, you know, tilling. And then you try to till and you catch the plastic. And we're low here. And there were days, you know, the girls would wade mud to their ankles. And, uh, and I remember asking Tim... Is there anything we could seed between the rows? He said, why couldn't you? And we have done it ever since. We, we seed um, ryegrass, and we try to get our plastic in early, and we seed. We just do it by hand. We just go through and, and spread it by hand. It makes for a lot of mowing, but mm-hmm. the rows look so much nicer. And and the ryegrass gets a real root mass and oh, will it make sure it does. a lot more solid to, to it's walk It's a pain on. the next year if you want to put plastic in because those clumps. Mm-hmm. But but it's good for the soil. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, we, we get a lot of mowing, time, labor into mowing, but it also absorbs more moisture. That has been a godsend. We actually sold our produce washer. Because even if we just, like cucumber, zucchini, we wipe, we wipe that all by hand. We just wipe it by hand. Uh, but if it's muddy, if it's rainy, and then if your vegetables spread out into the row, it's on grass. It's not on dirt. I so see. that has been 
oh, that's been, it has saved us. And, and the rows look so much nicer. It takes, it takes, you still have to weed eat sometimes along the edges, but it makes it so much nicer for the girls to pick, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, a wet morning, you know, it's wet grass. It's not wet dirt and mud. And with vegetables, are they heavy feeders, I assume? And how do you do, have you seen fertility improvement? How has the soil changed over the last 30 years of doing this? Hmm. I don't know that there's that much change, really. We've always had, although I wish I could get back that first year, the first year behind the market here, that was a pasture field. Grandpa never did know I overheard him say, they're going to regret that, they're going to regret that, that's heavy clay soil. It's beautiful soil. It wasn't heavy clay. But it was pasture for as long Mm -hmm. as I knew. And the very first year, we had that whole section full of pumpkins. It was beautiful. You know, Mm -hmm. no weeds, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, because it was grass all those years. Mm -hmm. Uh, One of the biggest things we have fought that I never saw until, well, it's probably for as long as we're doing this now, I want to say 15, 18 years, spiny amaranth. Do you know what that's Mm -hmm. like? Oh, we call it curse weed. (laughs) That is a curse. Mm -hmm. And it started along our creek bank. Really? Where did it come from? Washed. Washed Washed from from somewhere. somewhere. Mm Mm-hmm. But we, we didn't know what it was. Mm-hmm. We actually re, redid our pasture field to try to get rid of it. And Chris so was trying to watch. He got some of it down at his place, and he got it from here. Mm-hmm. Now, do you have a, a crop rotation like you do your sweet corn and oh, then your yeah. green beans? Like you have a, a real huge. plan. That's huge. Well, yeah. real plan? Kind of last minute, okay, now where was this last year? But crop rotation is huge, oh, mm-hmm. very huge. Um, uh, especially with Colorado potato bugs, you really have to, we, we always, we never plant anything in this. Now, sometimes in the garden up here, lettuce transplants, green onions, that doesn't seem to be such a big, big issue. Uh, but we put a lot of compost post on our fields. Um, that's always a big plus. Mm-hmm. So do you have Colorado potato beetle problems? Well, with the potatoes, we sure do. Uh, yeah. We 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 raised almost an acre this year, and a uh, oh, potatoes. Yeah, oh. and it was in a field that hadn't been plowed in twenty years, and uh, we hauled a bunch of compost on it and put gypsum on it, and I did not see a potato beetle in that patch all year. Not one. Are you serious? Last year I was in a different field. They destroyed it, like the whole thing. But I went down in close to the creek bottom where there's three feet of topsoil. And I really think it's just... You probably didn't even need compost there. nutrient-dense because if you get your sugars high enough in the plant, the beetles won't eat it. And they also say if you get your sulfur sulfur levels up with gypsum. So when right before I hilled them the first time... We sprinkled gypsum right in the row and then filled ah. that into. I don't know. I don't know what we did right, but what we did wrong was everything last year and this year everything. <laughs> but just it seems worked. those. I'm always perplexed with how do those beetles know where they're? They come out of the soil, don't they? I don't know where they come from, but they find potatoes usually. Well, they do, but I'm I'm almost certain that they come out of the soil. I'm like, how do they know where there's potatoes? But the one year up behind my dad's house, behind Adrian's house, there had never been potatoes there. And they were horrible. I was like, mm-hmm. why? Yeah. But it could be. I, I, I don't know what it is that we did right. I, I really think it's the nutrient density in the plant more than anything I else. Wonder. That they don't. Because, because sometimes because most, if your plant is healthy enough and your soil is healthy enough, they can even fight off cucumber beetles. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because they are, basically, they can process sugar. So if they would eat a high sugar plant, it would kill them. Oh, So wonderful. they're basically diabetic. So if you can get your sugar levels up, mm. there you go. Boy, that's, that's something why, good to know. Because last year, I, I had a foliar program where I foliared it every seven days um, with a foliar spray to try to get my sugar levels up. And I think 
they just loved that foliar spray. Uh, but it was in a in a field where the soil was degraded a lot more. Oh, okay. So it's I'm really we're going to hopefully dig them next week. I'm kind of excited because I I've, bet you're going to have a potato crop because this year I've got Yukon Golds that are oh, softball sized. <laughs> but I don't like the Yukons. No, oh. you let me know. Not oh, I love Yukons, but Yukons. We've always struggled. If it's a really big potato, they're hollow in the middle. Mm. So often. Yukon's much more than Kennebec's. Mm-hmm. But this year is a very good potato year. Last year was awful. Mm-hmm. I mean, I had a lady come here, and she, it was so hard on her. She said, I've never bought a potato in my life. Mm-hmm. And she had to. She said, I got nothing. I found a grower that did not plant until July, <laughs> and he had potatoes. <laughs> Because then the bugs are the beetles are gone yeah. by that time yeah. if you plant them late. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we did we tried that last year, but we didn't plant them late enough. We were okay. still too early. So mm. what it, when they were the worst, the plants See, were I, really small, mm. and they just oh yeah, then they have them. no they have mm. no resistance to it. Yeah. So yeah, I've heard it's been a <clears throat> wonderful potato year. It has, so. but it has been a prolific productive year for just about everything yeah. except dill. I couldn't raise dill this year. Dill. <laughs> really? <What? clears throat> Excuse me. What does dill that need? Dill is easy to raise. <laughs> does I, that need extremes? Uh, well, maybe. It's always fun to have dill because you know people raise cucumbers, but then they run around and can't find dill. Mm-hmm. Oh, and I'm like, we have it. <laughs> I seeded three times and had no dill, or just I mean a few heads, but it didn't go mm-hmm. far. But I was like, of all things, dill. <laughs> but just about everything else has been a very, very mm-hmm. productive. We've been blessed. It's yeah. a very productive year. Well, I, th- I think when you look at the weather across the United States, and, of course, I'm coming more from the, from the dairy farmer perspective, but we had the best weather in our region here than anywhere in the United States. Really? New York <clears throat> and Vermont were swimming in water. That's right. California and the West That's Coast right. is burning up. The upper Midwest had one and eight tenth inches of rain since March. Ah, um, that's, that's, so, you're right. I, I usually don't pay too much attention. I'm too involved here. But mm-hmm. I know one dairy farmer that we were talking to from Strasburg, and he said he has never, ever put the high quality hay away as he did this year yeah. and it was because the weather was just and there were though it seemed perfect. if you made your hay around may 10th to the 15th first cutting every 30 days you had a beautiful week mm-hmm. so all four cuttings mm-hmm. and now fifth cutting yeah are are were just amazing yeah. so we'll yeah. see a lot of lot of supply i think this winter just because of the quality because of the, of the wonder mm-hmm. but you would think if that translated to hay and corn and everything for the dairy farm that's got to have an impact on your produce as well. So your produce, mm-hmm. you would think, mm-hmm. is great quality too. Well, it has been overall. Mm-hmm. It has been. Yeah. Because, but, you know, I always say about the time I think I have it all figured out, the Lord throws a wrench in just to show me that I'm not in control. Mm-hmm. I mean, I can do a lot, and but you still have to do your part. Mm-hmm. But... It just, every year, something, somewhere, doesn't produce well, and often, I don't even know why. Mm -hmm. This year, it was dill, which, oh, I can handle that. Mm -hmm. Um, Cucumbers are kind of ticklish, too. I mean, they produce very well, and suddenly, they just all died, and that was the end of that. So, what would cause that? Is it a blight? A wilt, a A blight, blight. Usually, it's blights, yeah. Mm -hmm. Tomatoes. Never had such a glut of tomatoes in August like we did this year. The chickens got quite a few. (laughs) But, I mean, beautiful tomatoes. Mm -hmm. But they all came at once. Now I'm having to buy tomatoes just to keep them on the shelf because we don't have enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have problems with blight in tomatoes? Well, we didn't, but that's because we, we do a lot of preventive a lot of preventive work with that. We're on a program, Advancing Eco Ag. Okay. Now we've and had a, we've had John Kempf on the podcast. Twice, oh, really? Actually. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't know the guy. Oh, but you do. Must yeah. seems to know quite a bit. He does. And he learned it. I mean, he's just a self-educated guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But their program has worked well, and so uh, we use a lot of uh, calcium and and copper as preventions, and the copper. Because tomatoes can be so fickle. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, But this year, with the weather, it wasn't nearly as critical. When you have a year that it rains and rains and rains, then we struggle with blights because your leaves need to dry off. Mm Do you use that in your irrigation, or is that Irriga- a full... Fo- irrigation and foliar. And foliar. Mm-hmm. Irrigation usually once a week, and, and now if it's a bad year like that, then we would often foliar spray twice a, a week, but this year we didn't have... We just did once a week. Mm-hmm. And is so. your irrigation drip, or are you... Drip. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That is... That really is... Whoever invented that, I mean, you don't lose anything to evaporation. It just all goes right to the to the plant, mm-hmm. to the roots. And your water source would be out of the creek? No, we or, have a well. Oh, this you, creek would never. Okay, I didn't. It's know. not a big enough creek, no. Okay, we so have, we drilled a well for, okay. see, the, the the house is on city water. And, uh, but for the well, we didn't have to have it inspected or anything because it's not drinking water. So we have the well for the, for the barn, because we still have cattle in the barn. Mm-hmm. It's Chris's cattle. But then we piped it across, so we have a hydrant over there as well. Okay. So, yeah. And how many acres would you have that's irrigated? Oh, only uh, about five. Five acres. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And is that barely the, barely five? Is that all your produce is five acres that you mm-hmm. grow yourself? Well, since no, it's more than that. We have pumpkins. Uh, another three acres on the hill, but now that we don't have eight acres, eight to ten acres of sweet corn, it has really cut down mm-hmm. on the acreage. Because you can raise a lot of produce in a small amount oh, yeah. of acreage. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that eight acres of sweet corn, that to me just sounds overwhelming. Because it's not like you can go through and. But the thing is, that's interesting. Uh, at least now we know a little more how many dozens we actually sell. Mm. because we were bad at record keeping as far as, you know, you don't, when you pick it in the field, you pick a trailer load, you don't count it all. You know, roughly you had an idea, but we were really bad at not tracking uh, to see what, what our what our yield was because you brought it in, dumped it on the shelf, and you sell it. Now, the tomatoes, we always write down how many buckets, how many buckets, you know, for each field in the hoop house. But the corn, we were, but now that we are paying for it, you know, <laughs> yeah, we did about, you know, I think it was 5,400 dozen. How many dozen? How would dozens, you like to pick that? I wouldn't. Mm-hmm. Uh, how many dozen do you get per acre? Oh, I'd actually have to ask um, Furman because we, we bought a, I don't know how many acres he actually had. Because Ross Smith, our co-worker, his family raises 10 acres and sells it all on our system out of the front yard. Well, they're, no kidding. They're outside of Indianapolis. Mm-hmm. So uh, he was saying it's like 20,000 20, population and you get you average one and a half ears per plant or something like that. Like It was a lot more corn than I actually thought there would be. Now, we, most years, we don't want the second year picked. Mm-hmm. People like big ears. They they frown, turn away from little ones. But now, if it's a very uh, good year, but we can tell if somebody's picking second ears. <laughs> Last year, I panicked. I had too many orders, and I found this other guy, and I, I got corn from him. We threw, oh, well, we threw probably sixty seventy five percent of it away. Your second Just ears, too small. well. Bert took one. Le- Bert has picked enough corn. No, not size. Those second ears are fool. They can fool you, but he took one look and one feel, and he said these are second ears. There's nothing on them, or they're not feel. Your second ears seldom have full mm-hmm. rows of corn sure. on sweet corn. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. The cows might not mind that, but people do. Yeah. Especially because the price per dozen is going to probably <laughs> be the <right>. same. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I was like, oh, we can't let our customers see that. I mean, that you mm-hmm. can, yeah, you just have I to. remember the one year we in our sweet corn patch just for ourselves, I was doing custom foliar spraying at the time. So every time I came home, I would just rinse the sprayer out. It was all certified organic products, a lot of advancing eco ag. 
I would just spray the corn patch every time I rinsed the sprayer, which was four times a week probably. Oh. And sometimes, you know, if you finish in a field that was on a hillside, there was more left in the sprayer. So, I mean, I doused it, and I had up to four full ears on the plants. Are you just serious? Just because I fed them. Because when you look at the the potential of corn, like we're only scratching the surface of the potential of the corn. It was like, well, you couldn't afford to ever mm-hmm. feed your crop like that. But like that. I was just rinsing the sprayer, and I was like, wow, that is pretty impressive. Wow. So I even with it, we had incredible that. corn, really, and with four nice ears. That's our ears. best seller. Mm-hmm. That's our best seller. People say, "Why don't you do a bicolor?" We try to. If our customers like something, we try to stick to that. That's well, why that, I still raise Detroit dark red beets. I why change? Mm-hmm. And I did so. Corn and I assume <clears> tomatoes <throat> are probably the the big sellers. The big tomatoes, movers. corn, green beans. Okay. Yeah. But I have been astonished at some of the other crop. Red beets. Red beets are something I would have never guessed would be so popular. But it is. And they really been, are. Is that consistent or has consistent. that been something? No, that's that. Well, it has gradually. I, I've Well, people are aware that we sell large quantities for, for canning, pickling. But for some reason, I thought in my mind, oh, pickled beets, that's an Amish Mennonite thing. It is not at all. Mm-hmm. Not at all. And so, yeah, we have people, yeah, that drive quite a distance just to get beets. Oh, wow. But beets are very popular. Yeah, I never, um, but those, the the beans, tomatoes, corn would be your, your mains to end potatoes. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, the red potatoes, we raise all our own red potatoes, but we just, we start digging them when they're, you know, just little, and we dig those fresh just as we need potatoes, you know, some, at first it's about every other day. And so, but that was something that was interesting to me. People fussed about our good potatoes, and I'm like, a potato's a potato. I was thinking. Yeah, it's not. No. Freshly dug is just simply that mm-hmm. much better. You can take a <clears throat> freshly dug potato and eat it like an apple. And I don't know if I could, but... <clears throat> it, 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 it's I've as re- juicy as I remember apple. Grandpa... Klein using having the pocket knife that he used to clean the manure spreader. But, oh. you know, then he'd slice a potato and have a, the salt shaker and just salt the raw potato and eat really? slices of it just like an apple. <sighs> so. Have you seen some of the, like I'm thinking of kale and it's on, you mm. mentioned kale earlier, but like trends that stuff you didn't use to grow, but yes. now all of a sudden yes. it's eggplant. Eggplant. Okay. I didn't know what eggplant was. I didn't grow up on eggplant. And that is, that's a niche. I, I mean, people, uh, Asians especially love eggplant, uh, the, uh, the uh, oriental. They, they buy the others, but I have a few customers love the oriental eggplant. You know, it's long and skinny. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's not, I don't raise a lot. But kale was a big trend here several years ago. It was really popular. It's not nearly as popular as it was. Mm-hmm. Now we sell we sell ninety percent of our kale to Park Street Pizza. Mm. They use a lot of kale um, salads, um, and they had yeah they had just they just finished up a salad that uh, used a phenomenal amount of kale, <laughs> and uh, but that's where ninety percent of our kale does go. Swiss charge another little niche, I, but not many people. There's not too many people. The kale, the big thing was health. Um, people would put it in their smoothies, anything mm-hmm. to get greens, and and that's kind of you know things like that kind of come and go. And do you find those <clears throat> trends out from? Customers, or do you just hear customers and they ask for it, and you're willing to try a right, little patch, and- right? And usually in January, and when I'm doing seeds, I'll go on social media and say, "Is there anything new somebody wants me to try?" Mm-hmm. And uh, the one interesting thing was, uh, it's a light green zucchini uh, called Magda. It's a kusa squash. It's a Middle Eastern squash. And that's something we raise now. Well, I gained a customer from Canton because she saw I had them. Hmm. Middle Eastern heritage. Mm. And they knew what they were. But are they a big seller? Not really, because most people don't know what but, they are. 
But if you can get somebody <clears throat> in by raising that one vegetable, they're not going to drive down from Canton and just buy that. Exactly. So. And and she and her daughter come, oh, oh every couple of weeks they're here. Mm-hmm. So, but um, oh, there was another one. Oh, fruit-wise, there's nothing that we've sold in fruit that the price went up as much as blueberries. And that's been for years. Uh, it's the last years it's leveled out. Mm-hmm. But the health benefits of blueberries were a huge thing. And so blueberries are something we sell a lot of. Mm. And that has, and it started out. And I think really that's what what really pushed the blueberry price up, mm-hmm. well, was supply and demand. It was strictly mm-hmm. supply and demand. Well, that's surprising because aren't blueberries fairly easy to grow? I'm yeah, sure they're a whole lot easier than raspberries, but it's also, unless you have machine picked, you know, if it's hand picked, it's also a labor intensive one. There, whatever the cost of blueberries is, it is not enough for the pickers. I, I mean, back on the farm, we have two rows at 100 feet long each. So I don't know. We Martha probably froze 20 gallons this year, and because she loves them for smoothies, mm-hmm. and. Uh, I absolutely despise picking blueberries. <laughs> well, your quart box doesn't fill up. I know. It's kind of like, do the girls love to pick peppers? You bet they do. I mean, it's fun to pick peppers mm-hmm. because your bucket fills up so quickly. Where are the green beans? Do you raise any Much hot so? peppers? Oh, yeah. Like I love raising hot peppers. I want some. I now, this year I struggled with my germination. Oh, I was so disappointed. We got a new heat mat. And I thought, oh, I'm going to have this excellent germination because we start all our own seeds. And uh, my peppers didn't come up. I ended up buying more seed. But then my hot peppers, that I just love to raise those kind of for the fun of it. Well, you know, how many habaneros does one person need? (laughs) Or a a Carolina Reaper, reaper, you know, just a couple, yeah, one plant. That's if you're doing a giant batch. If you're just doing a small batch, you need a tip of one. A little bit. But this year, uh, the banana peppers we raise are Inferno. We've sold more bushels of hot banana peppers than we ever have. Really? It was wonderful. Because so often I get carried away and I put too many out. This year we could keep them moved. Yeah. Oh, those banana peppers with cream cheese inside on the grill. Mm. Oh. Yeah. That's yeah. delicious. Another thing that I might add is our, our cutting flowers. That's something that, the of course, I have girls that just love it. And I was just telling them today, it's one of the most difficult things, though, for me to track. Are we actually making money or are we just making it look nice? Because you can get a lot. But that just gradually started. I read an article in a a magazine about cutting flowers. And I thought, hmm. And so it it makes the place look attractive. Mm -hmm. But that has really grown for us. Just, you know, add bouquets. You know, it adds Mm -hmm. beauty to the place. Do you have bees? Oh, yes. Matter of fact, we had an older guy that always took care of them. And we lost our bees last winter, and Jerry just, I, I was like, shall I look for somebody else? Um, and he wanted me to. So now we okay. have uh, Jason Bossler. Okay. No, Bossler. 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 Mm-hmm. Bossler. And he brought four hives out, and he ended up bringing four more. So we see bees all the oh, time. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. They Mine really, just they packed really up are and busy. left two weeks ago. They swarmed. Oh, no, they left. swarmed. Like, what are you thinking? This You're time all dead. of year? Yep. Mm. I, was, I was so disappointed. Oh, I bet. Well, we were disappointed that we lost ours this last winter. Mm. I'm, I'm not quite sure because early in, you know, bird had checked, they were fine. Mm-hmm. They had a lot of honey. There was a lot of honey in the hive. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but yeah, you have to have bees. Interesting, when we were first starting this, you know, Grandpa always had bees mm-hmm. and we had zucchini out and all the ugliest odd shaped zucchini and i said bird i bet they're not being pollinated 
Dad had lost his bees to mites. I got on the phone, and by, I think it was that evening, um, that was with, uh, oh, the, uh, what's the place called in Worcester? Um, it's, not, it's OSU related. Oh, but anyhow, extension. Yeah, the extension office yep. uh, up there had, and I, we rented hives, and he brought two colonies down. Hives, colonies, how do you say it? Whatever. Bees. And, you know, it was amazing. In about two days, we had nice straight zucchini. Are you serious? I am serious. Wow. I've never forgotten that. Mm -hmm. And this year, uh, our first zucchinis were awful, ugly. I said, well, they look like they're not being pollinated. That's exactly how they looked. And I had somebody else tell me it was cold and rainy. Mm -hmm. And the bees weren't flying. Hmm. I was like. There was, like in, in May, there was, or April and May, there was that kind of cold, rainy yes. couple of weeks. And I got one swarm there that week. That was not a good time to work with bees because they were mad. Uh, because there was no sunshine. There yeah. was nothing blooming. Yeah. And I actually lost that one, too. Really? Uh, it was just so cold. I fed them, but Well, see, they didn't but survive. that's what we, we concluded because I looked, there were flowers, and I thought, why? And it warmed up, and we had nice. Mm -hmm. And I think they simply decided it's not nice enough to go out and work. Mm -hmm. But that's, uh, that pollination never ceases to amaze me. Mm -hmm. it's and and when, we, when I used to think of pollinators... Honeybees, but they're oh, the, the honey. The honeybee is actually one of the least efficient pollinators. When you look at the mason bee, the mason bee is out way before the honeybee is in the morning and the end of the, and the end of the day. Is a mason bee the it looks same like as a, a carpenter bee? bee? No, it's oh. it looks like a honeybee, but it's just a lot smaller. Oh, a lot smaller. Yeah, and I think honeybees and, are small. Yeah, they're they're. Dad has some there at his cabin. Okay. Um, they're super efficient pollinators. Okay. But it's it's just crazy how many different pollinators oh, yeah. are out there. And, but we all just kind Even of think flies. of Even flies. I was reading of a place that they hunt. Bumblebees are really good pollinators, mm -hmm. but they said they're too expensive. And they literally buy fly larvae oh, and put in this enclosed area to pollinate their flowers. <laughs> Oh wow! Jeez. Yeah. Do yellow jackets pollinate? Are they pollinators, or are they just? I hope they're not, because I despise I... them. <laughs> yeah, I I always. All look... I know they do is they they literally, um, they like the honey crisp apples better than any of the other apples, and they literally will drill a hole in them. Mm -hmm. You know, if they have a chance. I sure don't see them on flowers. They're on the fruit. Mm-hmm itself and trying to destroy it i was i was just hoping that maybe because i hate them so much maybe they, they do some bring some kind of value that i yeah. haven't Reach i out. haven't seen anything valuable with them that's how i feel about squirrels and raccoons too oh. <laughs> <laughs> i used to I think a, raccoons were cute till they start destroying a corn patch i'm trying to find the redeeming quality on both of those oh. too well How squirrels are cute they're tasty too <laughs> yeah i'm sure i'm sure so is do you have do you have a a plan going forward you know as far as is there somebody else that wants to take over one of the children or is there a you know contingency plan in place or i wish there were we're kind of in limbo. Chris always said he wants to, mm -hmm. but I don't know how he's going to do it. He's got too many, too many other things to do. So mm -hmm. I, I honestly don't know. And that's why I'm, well, Bert and I talked about it, because we, we tend to just kind of just go and just, but we have to plan. Mm -hmm. and, but that's what we're looking at tweaking you know if we can get somebody to raise this or that and if chris ever would take it over i know it would look different and that would be fine but at this point you know if until he knows for sure but the next generation's coming abby is 16 and and works here part-time in the in the summer and does a wonderful job you know that next generation's not that far behind you know mm -hmm. don't really want to see the place go to nothing either mm -hmm. 
Sure. But at the same time, Bert keeps wanting to put up a greenhouse. And I'm like, I don't want another greenhouse at this point in our life unless somebody is because, you know, he loves the flowers. And see, we start with, and so our, our downtime is very short. It's by February, here you go again with flower plugs, you know. And then it's wide open until when? Well, we're slowing down now. October, okay. we slow down. We mm-hmm. we sell, but, you know, the fall crops, but the beauty of fall crops, you don't have to pick it fresh every day mm-hmm. like this other stuff. Mm-hmm. But, um, but if we can get, you know, some help raising some, and what I really wish we had, this is would be my dream is to have a field manager that, I don't have to say, oh, we got to plant. We have to plant green beans every week and a half to two weeks. You have to plant green beans. You always have to think ahead. That that gets wearying, you know, when we've got tons of orders and customers, and because August is just intense, mm-hmm. and you always have to think well, ahead. You have to plan, you know, when would you harvest, and then after the 22nd of June, you always have to add extra days because it just takes longer for your crop to mature. And I don't do fall crops like I should, fall garden, like radishes, let, as like as much as I should because we simply don't have enough time to get it taken care of in August like we should. But, yeah, that's, it, it remains to be seen, but we, we can't keep up the pace we're going now. Mm-hmm. But if we can get some help. But if you'd have a field manager, that would. But who can afford that? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because then if, if you look at getting a field manager, okay, are you going to have to up your acreage to justify having yeah. that? You know, so it's there's a trade-off. Well, my dream would be even just um, with the girls, the workers we have. Now, see, the, we have one that's, she's a wonderful, she's been here eight years. But she'll never, ever, ever be a field manager. It's just not in her personality. Mm -hmm. But there's another one that's only been here three years. If I tell her, oh, remember, we have to do this, this, I don't have to worry about it because she doesn't forget. Mm -hmm. And I try to delegate. That's what I really have to do. And I've got got, um, a really, really good girl in the market. And if, if I can just delegate some of that stuff. Because lettuce, you have to start lettuce every week. Let us and call Robbie every week. I don't want to have to remind someone, did you do that? You know, I want to be able to put somebody in charge, and it's done. So if you can do some of that, mm-hmm. that would take pressure off, too, mm-hmm. for you, the future. Mm-hmm. You don't, so you take a lot of big orders, and then everything else is sold here at the market, right? You don't, you don't. Go to other markets or no? Okay. No, we've been asked to go, but it's too much work. I mm-hmm. mean, if you'd have another family involved, then maybe you could do that. Mm-hmm. I mean, the people that go to a bigger metropolitan area, <clears throat> they, they can charge twice what we do, mm-hmm. but you also have to get it there. <laughs> But it keeps us, I mean, <clears throat> I personally am not interested in going anywhere else. I enjoy being here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, in the meantime, you know, with finding other growers to do, like you said, your fruit, and you found somebody to do the sweet corn, uh, how do you find those people? Do, do they have to be, are you looking for certain criteria, or do they have to? Well, it's interesting. Um but I've had different people call, can I raise something for you? The thing you have to kind of watch is, like, there's one guy, a, a young family, you know, and he'd like to get into it, but you also have the, those people then, they want to raise for you, but if they can sell it at home, they will. And that's not the kind of person I'm looking for because they want us when they're stuck with a product mm-hmm. and have way too much. Mm-hmm. But if they can get a little more, and, and you know, I, I, I understand that. But you do have too many people that don't understand the concept between wholesale and retail. Mm-hmm. And usually if they're having a good year or a good crop of something that they can't get rid of, 
you're probably having the exact same thing. <laughs> Which is why we uh, seldom, like the produce auction, uh, we seldom sell something there because if we're flooded, they're flooded. Mm -hmm. So if we have excess, oh, we took a lot of zucchini to the food bank. There's a couple that lives in town here, and they're involved with the food bank of Tuscarawas County. So if we have excess, we just we call them, they come pick it up. Mm -hmm. And that works really well because it enables us to keep our product fresh because that's huge. Every morning when we go down, we go through all the peppers, all the green beans. You know, to, freshness is key. And if you... If it doesn't move fast enough, you can't keep it fresh. <laughs> and the tomatoes, for example, that we grow, see a lot of these commercial growers, their tomatoes will hold for weeks and weeks. Well, ours don't. Ours don't. You also don't pick them when they're bright green. <laughs> <Yeah>. No, <laughs> we do not. There's a reason that they're tomatoes. They're ripened, yeah. yeah. There's a reason when you put that slice of tomato on a sandwich, it tastes a lot better, too. Yeah. <laughs> You, you uh, mean you can actually taste the yeah, tomato? Yeah, it tastes like a tomato. <laughs> yeah, but there is a guy. He's certified organic, and I always kid him. Uh, we actually had it worked out really well. It's Johnny Miller. Do you don't know him? I don't think so. Anyhow, he had asked us, could we raise green beans for you? He said, with his workforce, he's thinking, well, hmm. maybe because they don't have a lot of picking oh. to do in June. I know which John you're talking about now. Yeah, and, oh, he's great. Mm -hmm. Um well, they raise green bees. But I said, I don't want 18 bushels at a crack. I mean, uh, yeah, he, <laughs> it worked really, really well. Mm -hmm. But he's... He's really downsizing uh, next he's year. He's thinking of quitting. Yep. He, we had him on the podcast. Oh, really? as oh a, did you? John Miller, yes. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, he, he... He's a... He's, he's very knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. I, he was I, our I, first produce grower that we had on. Really? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think there's some things going on with the markets that he had that just he said I can't I can't, can't afford it. He can't make a li make no. any money doing no. it. So um, that's what he said because he said June was a deciding point. It was he said I can't um, yeah he can't go on like that. You know he's paid he's like us. I mean we're paying the help we get is all paid help. We have mm -hmm. you know we don't have a row of kids here that are. Mm -hmm picking it for nothing which they should be paid too but you know within reason mm -hmm, sure. but that's where he's at you know it's all higher but he bailed and this was great because park street went from 10 pounds of kale a week to like 35 and i'm like our, our plants can't keep up so i called john i said can you help me out oh well he had beautiful kale he was delighted and we were delighted so mm -hmm. just you know if you can i love when you can work and same with other markets. There's a couple markets around here. You know, if we're short or we don't have something, I may call them and say, hey, do you have so-and-so? And I'll send them there. Mm -hmm. You know, I would rather work with a few of these than sure. try to compete with them. Well, Mary, uh, this has been a really interesting conversation. Um, it's what what you do, like the picking every day is something I didn't realize, that you had to plant like every week so you have fresh all the time. I guess that never real. I come from the farming. You plant the corn in the spring. You harvest in and the fall. Done, yeah. Then you're done in the hay, you know, a couple cuttings. Um, and so you have home gardeners. I had different home gardeners call this year. Oh, my green beans didn't come up. Well, I said, well, plant again. See, a lot of home <laughs> gardeners just plant once. Mm -hmm. And then if it doesn't do well, they think they're lost. I'm like, you keep planting green beans. Mm -hmm. We would have still been picking green beans this week if Bert wouldn't have tilled them out. <laughs> oops. Uh, yeah, that was an oops. You know, they don't sell fast. Mm -hmm. But no, you have to constantly mm -hmm. plant. You know, we don't, there's, I don't think of onions. Onions is the one thing. They're delightful to raise. I love raising onions. Very labor intensive when you plant them. We do it all by hand, but you plant them once and you're mm -hmm. done. Now, green onions, we plant every week. Okay. Every week for a fresh supply. Wow. Hmm. Yeah. That's the, the amount of labor that 
that you do to keep your stand and your customers going is wow that's a, a lot it's of a, work there, it's, it is a lot of work mm-hmm. i mean any way you look at it mm-hmm. because if a young couple would ask me you know they want you know sometimes people look at the the market and they think this is this is really what we want to do and i'm like are you sure it looks beautiful think it through mm-hmm. but it is it is and that's what i'm saying i never intended for it to consume our lives the way it does. Mm-hmm. But yeah. it just so gradually got there. It all started with just wanting to take with a, a trip. With a card table, yeah, with <laughs> wanting to take a trip. <laughs> well, we took the trip. <laughs> and you're still on it now. <laughs> yeah. uh, can people, do you have a website or just a Facebook page? Facebook page. We okay. keep debating about, I have somebody that would love to design a web page. I don't know, would it, would it pay us? To, to do a website. Uh, it would be a way of us to communicate even more of who we are mm-hmm. and what we do. But I'll admit, Facebook is a phenomenal tool. Yeah, it is. Um, there are people that simply watch Facebook or Instagram for the new product, you mm-hmm. know, what's in season. Mm-hmm. So I do try. I'm not good at, at posting. I, I don't enjoy that. But it is a tool. I mean, there's people that watch. I mean, they don't know. Like now we have winter potatoes. And I was like, okay, I've got to post that. Within, oh, I think within an hour or two that I had posted it, a lady came and bought a bag of potatoes because she saw it on Facebook. Mm-hmm. But there are people, you know, it's now the, the frustration I have then with social media is, is people message me on there instead of picking up the phone and calling and asking me. You know, you'll post a picture of potatoes and they'll ask about mums or something completely different. And that, you know, because you really have to stay on your toes Mm -hmm. and that's something I would love to hand over to somebody else. Mm -hmm. Naomi did quite a bit of that last year for me, but she didn't get it done this year Mm -hmm. as much. And that that is Sweetwater Farm on Facebook? Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. And Instagram as well? Yes. Okay. Well, hopefully people will check it out. Mary, thank you so much for taking the time. Really, really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. Thank you.